All right. We should be live now. Type into the live chat if you can hear me and see me. It is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop here with Mr. Richard Furch, who is in sunny Los Angeles, California. Richard, how are you doing today? How's it going? Taking in a couple of rays outside here, you know, uh, because normally we sit in studios, but when we talk, we don't need to. Yeah, indeed. I like to see there's some activity out there. There's a trampoline back there. I saw there look oh, like yeah. there's a basketball trampoline. court where you are at the studio. Yeah, a little bit outdoor seating, you know, like a little bit of vibes. You have to have you have to have that. You know, people come over, they want to make records, but they also they also want to remember that they were there, so to speak. Yeah. But they, for sure. I think that's important. Um, so in case you missed it, Richard just did a live masterclass uh, or a live premiere of his masterclass uh, that we recorded recently. We had a live premiere and a whole bunch of questions coming in and we've saved some of the best questions from that live premiere for this live Q&A. And I see your questions coming in right now. We've got new questions coming in. I'll go through some of the best questions that came in during the premiere and then I'll hit your questions that are coming into the chat box right now. So feel free to enter your questions into the chat box as they go along. And uh, we'll pick the best ones as we go along and answer as many as we can. Super excited to have Richard here. In case you're not familiar with him, he is a multi-platinum, multi-diamond selling mix engineer. He's worked with huge artists along the lines of Frank Ocean and Jay-Z, Whitney Houston, Prince. Uh, I think he did some stuff with The weekend early in his career. He was with uh, Outkast and Usher and uh, Fountains of Wayne in the studio. So really storied career. Super excited to have him here. Also, big shout out and thanks to the artist Gentle Bones for letting us dive under the hood of this track. Some tremendous insights here. I'm going to start with a couple of questions of my own and then get to yours. But beautiful sounding mix, international pop track with lyrics in both Chinese and English uh, from a Singaporean artist and a bit of an R&B feel in there as well. Um, really well put together. And uh, big thanks also to Sonarworks. Um, MixCon presentations are always free to the public and they're free to the public thanks to our sponsors. And the sponsors on this one are Sonarworks. It's a great fit because Richard uses them in his studio. He has uh, now an Atmos system in his studio and he uses Sonarworks to actually match all of his satellite and additional speakers to his main speakers, which is, I think a really creative use for it. Uh, if you're looking to tune your room, tune your speakers or tune your headphones so you can trust what you're hearing better Better. Sonar Works Sound ID reference is an absolutely killer solution. Uh, even high end studios can make use of it. And uh, the most of us working in, you know, further from high end studios can especially make use of it. So it really helps people out at all levels. So check them out, sonarworks.com. With all that out of the way, I guess there's only one more thing to mention. We are giving away more than $10,000 worth of free gear for MixCon. So check out the link for that in the description and uh, in the comments here. All right. Uh, we are going right now with the live Q&A. First question for me, well, before I pull up your questions, is one of the things that I noticed here, Richard, I was listening to this presentation on my big main speakers when I was reviewing it before it went live. And then when it went live, I actually listened to it on my phone. Mm -hmm. And I was amazed at how well the mix translated to the phone. When I was on my big speakers, I was like, oh, this sounds really good. The mid range is kind of like really well organized and forward. I bet this is going to translate well to small systems. I heard it on my phone and it just sounded incredible. I could make everything out. So I want to get your ideas on. I heard in there that you do some mixing on Apple EarPod Pros, but what are your thoughts on making sure that a mix will translate from a big system all the way down to the smallest devices and still sound not just coherent, but really good? Yeah. No, thank you for noticing that. I mean, um, it's an interesting thing. You know, I, I talk about translation uh, quite a bit. Uh, translation is, is a tricky thing, right? I think translation has to be understood. Translation, what I, for, let's start with a quick thing. What I think translation is not, and what I think some people think it is, it doesn't mean it sounds the same everywhere. It's, mm. just, it's just impossible. You, you have your nice little speaker, nice speakers with a subwoofer, hopefully, or maybe, and you have a phone. Like to to actually think that they would sound the same or something like that is obviously a futile in, endeavor. It's it's impossible. Just leave that on the side. <laughs> you know, that's cool. That's cool. Um, the interesting part is like what is important in the record, right? Finding and identifying that. So you said, like for instance, the mid range, which a lot of stuff happens in the mid range, snare, top end of the kick. Uh, hopefully top end of the bass, that's obviously a problem, right? And uh, mm -hmm. vocal levels, et cetera, that happens there. But also um, all the things, basically what translation to me is like these things, the things that make up that record, 
that are most important, the things I want to hear over the grocery speakers when I definitely don't hear the 808 anymore. Right. <laughs> you know, that has to sound similar. And uh, similar, uh, the word would be maybe device specific. Right. Of course, the phone is very mid range. And it's actually, most phones these days sound pretty good. Like there's actually, you go like there's a pleasing quality to them. Yeah, I'm not talking, talking audiophile, but I'm talking, I am actually happy to listen to a phone. There's a clarity to it. And knowing that people actually uh, uh, consume, I don't like that word, but like experience music on their phones is, uh, is it doesn't make me unhappy. You know, so my job is to like make sure that when you listen on the big ones and on the small ones and on the headphones, that the principal information of the record feels the same. But if you actually, you know, put them next to each other or switch them back, it doesn't sound the same. It does not. And that's not the goal. Um, also, what's important is. This is something really interesting that I heard a while back. Give me, a, give me one second. Give me, give me one moment for the for the. Uh... We're just trying to make sure that we don't all of a sudden have a weed whacker come in in the middle of a uh, Richard's uh, question right, here. So, that, see, that's uh, that's that's when you do outside work. Uh, no, uh, um, so uh, the other thing is, um, yeah. So that the basically the mid range that I'm, I'm trying to carve out the information about the the uh, the record that is most important has to be in both places. Um, it has to sound convincing in both places. It doesn't have to sound the same in both places. Does that does that make sense? So 100%. like to, to take a lot of effort to make those things happen and also like checking them on those devices. Uh, makes a lot of sense to me. So what I heard a while back ago, this is a um, this is a mastering. Bob Ludwig said this, right? He said like he actually looked into this kind of problem of translation because as a mastering engineer, he was very very much that was one of his problems. Like what how, should I shift? Should I what should I? How should I approach a new world with many more uh, devices? And basically, he I think he te teamed up with JBL. He said to like find a statistic change of like are all speakers brighter are all speakers more bass heavy etc cetera, etc cetera, on a statistic uh, overall level and the answer that he came up with apparently is that if you talk about it broadly about everything it's the same like basically you have as many speaker systems that are pushed in the in the high end as and and uh, as many as you have in, you know, that might have a, a bigger base, et cetera. So he took away from me, he's like, listen, the the actual answer is still to try to make the best balanced mix, EQ yeah. and uh, musically speaking, and it will, it will give you the best chances to actually translate. So basically the idea, hey, let me mix everything brighter because then it translates better, is just incorrect. Right. You know, you just, like it's just, you will sound bad on some devices. There is just no way around it. Free yourself from the fact that you don't have to please every device. It's impossible. The world is big. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and this and is very interesting because exactly what Bob Lugwood found, I believe that uh, Sonarworks found when they did their own studies of this stuff, mm. that they were trying to find what's the average speaker system sound like. And it turns out when you average all speakers together, they basically sound flat because they're all yeah. flawed and skewed in different ways. So the average between all of them is more or less flat. So if you're trying to get something well balanced, that's your best bet for for translation. Yeah, and and I, and I subscribe to that, and I try I try for that. Yeah. Well, I have one other question for me, and then I promise uh, you guys I'll get to all of your great questions that are coming in. We have a whole bunch from the uh, premiere and a whole bunch right now in the chat box and the live Q and A. Feel free to keep on typing them in. But my last question, hopefully, it's a useful one to you guys. Uh, I was really curious about it. One of the things that I um, heard you talk about, there's the first time I ever heard it, was that you like to put in the bass last. And yes. I wanted to get your sense about um, how you manage the low frequencies, because again, your bass and your kick were totally audible on smaller speakers. I think that's in part because of how tight you got them and how much you made sure that they had presence in the audible range and weren't just about low frequencies. Mm -hmm. uh, but can you give us a little bit sense for how you like to get kick and bass to fit together and a little bit more detail on why you put the bass last and what general part of the frequency spectrum it might end up uh, filling in. I mean, uh, it must depend a lot on the arrangement, but um, if you can give us just a little bit more specifics there, we'd love to hear them. 
No, 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 you're totally right. So basically, um, I get uh, asked this particular question often, especially after I say I don't really mix with bass in, right? Um, so basically what I'm trying to do is this. When you, when you think about the role of the bass, it is not a surprising role. It is in a place that is always the same, basically. You know, like uh, it holds down the bottom, holds down the very often the tonic of the, uh, of the particular chord that comes in. And, uh, and it's supposed to sound solid uh, unless, I mean, there's one, one exception where it's like basically plays like James Jamerson kind of licks all into the upper mid range. That's, that's one difference. That's that part is a little bit more complicated, but in many other cases, I mean, we're looking at bass notes, quarters, uh, full uh, whole notes, etc., that are just supposed to come in at the same level. And the mm -hmm. problem is actually not the bass mixing, like the low end, is not that hard. The problem is to keep the low end straight and basically have every note, like, let's say you have a four bar progression, they go up and down, right? So have every note speak the same. So now, um, when I basically mute the bass for the longest time, um, I basically carve out everything around it. I, what's what's left that should be down there? Probably the kick drum and some kind of uh, a, a, sorry. I'm gonna talk uh, 808 and bass is the same in my in my particular uh, approach here, right? So, but the kick might be down here, but everything else, like for instance, the low end, the low E on a guitar is 82 hertz, right? So theoretically, there's nothing musically important under there, mm -hmm. you know, and that goes for many many parts i mean you know piano might be lower because it actually has a bass component to it <laughs> mm -hmm. but otherwise the, the low notes in the parts and if it's well arranged should not be very much in the bass area so if you turn off the bass and low cut a bunch of stuff but also just use volume or just eq to like duck some parts of the parts that are not musically important you would get like this whole space let's say from 30 hertz up to, well, just where the guitar starts. So 80, 90, let's let like for ease of sex, 20 to 100 hertz. That is, should have nothing in it except for kick drums at this moment, mm -hmm. if the bass is off, right? Mm -hmm. If you're successful with that, you immediately, it's not so much that you carved out the space, but it's like you decluttered and moved away everything that could possibly be in the place that the bass should be, right? So the moment I actually unmute the bass and under the under the assumption that the bass is either evenly programmed or compressed, though I do actually like, for instance, let's say it's an 808, uh, I do like a lot of volume automation because a producer might have programmed it to be uneven mm -hmm. and I basically, I even it back out. If, if it makes sense, you know? But when you do that, once the bass part does this thing, like holds down the bottom without doing anything to it, you basically can just turn it on and it should just fall right into place. Now, the only, the only thing you're missing here is how much bass overall do I want? Sure, that's genre specific and also is specific how you hear music. That makes me different from you and that's great. Um, and the other thing is that you have to have the trust. This is an interesting thing. So I have a very, very powerful monitoring system that is literally flat to 20 hertz. Mm -hmm. So I can hear it when it's, when it's correct. And basically it means to me, it's like mixing bass, mixing low end is actually not that hard, I think. Hearing low end. Yes. It's hard. Mm -hmm. So now, but here, here is, here's something like a little bit of a trust fall. If you know for a fact that your bass response in your speaker system is compromised, mm -hmm. right? And in many, in most places it is to some degree. Be strong enough to use meters. For instance, I use a VU meter to test if all the low notes are all the same level. Use that information and go like, this is where the bass should be. I'm not compensating for these notes because maybe maybe a note uh, booms or rings into in your room, and that's nothing you can do about it. You can't right. fix that. Those are notes and nulls and uh, and uh, and humps, <laughs> basically. Yeah. But if you actually try to mix into that, correcting what you're hearing, you're actually making it worse. 
right? You may be taking a totally flat, well-controlled base and adding humps and nulls in it just to uh, get rid of issues that are in your room and not in the sound itself. Exactly. And so I think uh, this is this is something that I strongly believe in. Um, I believe that your chances of getting a low end right is better if you do nothing than mm. if you do something in a room that you cannot fully trust and that you know you cannot fully trust because you're sitting in front of you. It's like, like just admit it. It's not the best low end in your room. Cool. Yeah. Leave it. Like how yes. bad can the person have programmed it? How bad can they have played it? But mm -hmm. actually, how bad can it be produced by your speakers? Yeah, pretty bad. <laughs> so so the, it ta it takes it takes some. It's like I said, it's a tr like a trust fall. It takes some guts. But yeah. I think if you try it this way, you come out with better result over time. And then it's just a matter like is the bass louder or is it softer? Because you already solved the problem. Is it even? Because that you can see on a meter, literally. Right. That is so brilliant. Um, it sounds so simple when you say it, but I've never heard it explained exactly that way. Um, I, I'm really going to remember this one and take this to heart. But it also reminds me of a little bit of advice I've given newer mixers too, which is along the lines of don't boost what you can't hear. Right. You know, some people have this inclination of, I'm not hearing a lot of subs in this, so let me boost some. And they're still not hearing the subs, so they boost more. And then it comes in for mastering and there's like a whole bunch of subs on it that they never knew was there because they were boosting frequencies that they thought were deficient, but weren't. But the same exact thing can happen with cuts. You're chasing yeah. around this phantom resonance at 80 Hertz or 120 Hertz. So you're cutting things and all of a sudden it sounds even in your room. And now you take it out to your car or somewhere else and it sounds totally different and uneven. And that's because you actually made it less even trying to make it sound more even in your uneven room. So I love this idea of a touching it less and B double checking evenness on meters. And I think that's a great answer, especially because the, there's such an average slow level on a meter, particularly yeah. an old VU style meter of a bass instrument that it, it looks like every note is around zero on your VU meter. It's probably even enough. And now pick the overall average level that's best for you. Um, of course, you may be thrown a little bit off because some notes jump out and some don't. So finding that perfect average level is a little bit harder still, but hopefully with a little bit of acoustic treatment and maybe something like sonar works to, you know, make the sweet spot in your room even more consistent that you can uh, get those issues to be better and better. Uh, yeah. while we're working our way up to being in the room is as great as yours. Uh, yeah. So uh, super insightful stuff here. And this brings us to the first question from the audience that came in from the live Q&A. We're 20 minutes in and I'm asking my first question from you guys. I'm so sorry for the wait, but I hope no, and I trust that, that some of that stuff was useful for you because I don't know if this stuff is burning uh, in my brain. I, I hope it's burning in some of your brains too. First question to come in through the live Q&A uh, around these lines. Eric Iverson asks, what are the dimensions of the room that Richard's mixing in? Oh, it is huge. Um, my room is 26 feet long and it is, uh, at the widest, because it's, it's a little bit of a trapezoid, uh, at the widest in the back, it's 22 or so. And in the front, it's about 18, but it is, it is huge. And in a moment here, the reason I'm out here is because it's beautiful. And also because in my room, there's a VO session that is uh, ending any moment now. In the moment they're walking out, I'm going to walk back in and give you a little bit of the mini tour there. But it's a huge room, which helps with the low end, how it um, how it propagates through the room. Um, but as every room, it has bad spots and good spots. And luckily, the not luckily, by design, the sweet spot is is very very tuned and very very accurate down to 20 hertz it's uh it, yeah no that's that's important to me you know but but as the same like if i lean against the wall i'm gonna get a boomy sound <laughs> you know like every yes. other room has walls are like that uh next question here i think you might have answered this one later on in your presentation but early on henny asked does the audio to the speakers come from the renderer or through the Dolby bridge back into Pro Tools? Do you use the new virtual audio routing option from Pro Tools to route the audio? Well, um, that's a very good question. Actually, no, I, I don't use the Dolby bridge. I use the um, I use the Pro Tools send and return plugins. And there's a very specific reason. Um, when you first had the Dolby bridge, and this is probably what he's referring to, basically you could you could send the outputs of the renderer directly to your Pro Tools interface. And basically the renderer would kind of take away, it would take away your, your Pro Tools interface. 
basically it wouldn't be used the audio the playback engine in pro tools would become audio bridge it goes out there and then uh and then and then it would go to the speakers this presented two problems give me one second i'm gonna walk in uh, yeah. and well i'm walking and can get back to work too out there yeah no exactly so um so th this presented two problems one was uh well I had to change playback engines every time I went from stereo to Atmos, which I didn't like. I didn't like, I didn't like disconnecting my setup for another setup, basically. Right. Um, now we're back in here. This is better. And um, there we go. There's the room. Um, Beautiful. And um, just closing the door to get a little bit more privacy for our live Q&A here. <laughs> the other problem was that once um, once you do that and you want to actually listen to other people's records, uh, I don't know if you know this, but Apple Music has no uh, way to get you discrete Atmos output out of any computer. Mm. Like you can listen to your headphones, but you can't listen to the whatever 12 speakers I have here. So right. I had to do that with a separate receiver. Now, in mm -hmm. order to not buy something like a, an Avid Matrix or an, a new full new setup, that had to be routed in, into Pro Tools with like a monitoring matrix that I can then um, send out to the speakers. I, I don't know if you're following me. So the, the shortest answer is Pro Tools with a regular interface, which in this case is a, a 16 by 16 Avid IO. The outputs would be directly go. They went directly to the speakers, and the inputs came from this Marantz receiver, which has XLR uh, outputs and it's insanely expensive, like two grand for for something that basically is an interface for an Apple TV, which is really annoying. Yeah. Um, but it's the only way that he can actually listen to stuff, right? So the only solution at the time was the send and return plugin, which basically lets Pro Tools send to the render and return back in. Then I built an aux matrix for the monitor return. Basically that also has the sound ID uh, plugin on it for the, uh, uh, for the tweak and tune. Um, and now to answer your last question, yes, in the last version, they now added the aux IO, which means now you can actually add more inputs. And because I'm a busy man, <laughs> <laughs> I have not changed over the system because obviously we'll take some re-engineering and there will be a moment where you're like, okay, everything works except for, and then you go crap. Yes. So I basically at the moment, at the very moment, I have a system that works, but it is on my mind to basically go into the audio bridge instead and then still use the interface in, in Pro Tools uh, afterwards. That's the plan. I hope that will that answers your question, but that works for me. Yeah, I think that's a good one. If you need any more clarification, Henny, let us know in the new chat here. A couple more questions that came in through the uh, during the uh, original premiere. Telly just wanted to say, great info so far, and nice Roy Lichtenstein placement to boot. I think you used like <laughs> one of the pictures you have hanging up there. Um, Eric again asks, uh, what is Richard's process when starting a mix? What are the very first things he does? Um, I mean, the very first things is basically my assistant goes all the way yep. through it, you know, so basically sorting files. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, in, the, in the video mentioned that everything gets re-leveled to a zero reuse uh, signal because that's, that's how I look at gain staging. Mm -hmm. um, but after that, I mean, on a, on a, on a more creative level, I mostly put, put the instrumental together first. Uh, I do start with the drums, not because I think the drums is the best place to start, but because normally the drums are the things that need the most engineering mm. to go from, and I say this a lot, to go from this to that. Like I always say, like, my, my, my client doesn't matter how good they are. It does matter. <laughs> they sent me a rough mix and I always feel the rough mix has a musical intention that is great because otherwise I wouldn't get a gig. Like everybody assumes, hey, we're almost there. Otherwise you wouldn't get hired to mix. Yeah, so cool. I fi feel that their record sounds like this, very compact, true to what they're trying to do, but not all the way there. And my job is to do this, like mm -hmm. to like explode it in that way. And, um, but at the same time, I need to keep it as the intention 
Like I can't make this out of this or that. Right. You get fired for that very quickly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like but when you come up with with mixes that are so far removed from the rough mix that people go like, what happened to the song? Then basically, I mean, you would have to be batting a thousand to get that get yeah. that past your client. I mean, you know, every now and then you go like, you know what, let, let, let me show you this version of your mix that I think really impressed, uh, not impressed because I don't, I'm not trying to impress my client. I'm trying to give them what they need. That's right. a very big difference because we don't want to hit them over with a, ch- a stick and say, this is better because they won't believe you <laughs> most of the time, you know, but, but if you, if you go left field, basically I still have to give them back uh, kind of a version of like, this is your rough mix but much better and this is my mix now and then a second version go like but if you actually let me be creative here's another take at it whatever crazy delays crazy this and that and the other but it it doesn't happen often because many people do like i mean even with the deadlines they give you the mix on monday and they, it releases on friday um mm-hmm. there's a there's a there is a good uh, there's a good amount of fear and i don't actually mean that in a bad way um caution you know you made it this far to something that everybody in the team agrees is a hit you do not want that on the last three days you don't want to lose that right you know so if you get something back that is like totally different the whole team basically ducks and goes like what happened and (laughs) i try to not be in that place very often unless i have a very very good reason you know um but yeah afterwards like instrumental first vocals separate uh, secondly uh, and then there comes this time when all of a sudden everything is in play like you just keep listening and keep listening you're like okay this one up this one down this one brighter this one darker um and then it becomes not a process anymore it's just like what else am i hearing and then there's this moment when you go like hey i have i've listened to this mix now three times in a loop and i basically have not made a change anymore well it seems like i'm done here mm-hmm. um, but that's kind of the process you know no, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess that when things do get reinvented, it's probably not on a single, but, you know, like track eight on the album project with like, oh, this one didn't quite turn out how we wanted it, but we want it on the album anyway. Can you be weird with this one? And yeah, uh, but it's chances of that happening on a lead single where people have already fallen in love with the production is pretty slim, right? Yeah. And you, and you have to want, um, you want to, uh, one thing is important is you have to honor the people in the process like the producer who created this piece that you're allowed to work on they're probably pretty good at it maybe not a mixer as in they're not doing it 300 times a year but with the tools at hand and i say that in the master class too we all have the same tools at this point it's very seldomly that you that you get something that you've never heard of right or that makes the sound so much better in a different way um so the material you get is with intention most of the time and i have to honor that intention i think this is good i really love the way you talk about uh, being allowed to mix the project because i think one of the things that happens to a lot of newer engineers who didn't maybe come up through the studio system where they started working on big projects from the beginning with incredibly talented people but they're instead teaching themselves working on their own bands working on their friends bands is they're used to being the smartest guy in the room the one guy who really knows the audio engineering stuff and they kind of go into the projects thinking like i know better about mixing and production than you but like that's only going to continue to be the case as long as you keep on working with mediocre people or people who just haven't gotten very good yet or f- fellow hobbyists. But when you're at the level working on the kinds of projects that you are, everyone is really good. You know, you're no longer the best guy in the room. You have your specialty, but you can't go in there uh, see, trying to seem like you know better than the producer and know better than the artist. And you're the one who knows engineering because you're at a place where every single person on the kinds of projects you work on is probably pretty far along in their game. And uh, I like how much you respect that and how important that is uh, when you want to do really, really good projects. Well, there's a, there's a, this really, there's this thought, I tell this to my assistants all the time. And like the moment you go, you listen to a rough mix and kind of think like, oh, it's trash, which might be mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. And, you, and the moment that that thought pops in your head, like, oh, I'm going to show them. Yeah. You're going to get fired. <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm not kidding like that's, yeah, that, that's the time when you like 
it's maybe you're too cocky or whatever it happens, but like there's a very good chance that 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 project will not go smooth because you just basically put in your head that what what they have is not good somehow and you're like the rescuer, which is not true. What what actually is happening is it's not as good as it could, should be. You're supposed to figure out what they were trying to do, and you're supposed to enhance that. And if you do that, then you will actually make it better without being that person that goes like, ah, I know better. Because yeah, that moment, very often, I I would say that that's one of the number one reasons to get fired. Yeah. Coming into it, assuming there's something good in here and it's my job to figure out what it is, um, is a great bias to have. All right, uh, moving on to another question. Uh, we've uh, already taken up more than 30 minutes of uh, Richard's time here on the q and I'm super happy you're that you're able to be with us this long. Um, is it okay if we go through a few more questions? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm here. No oh, worries. Wonderful. This is, I like doing this. Good. Uh, I, I like hearing it. You're really great about talking about this stuff. Um, so I've already had a few kind of like head explode moments already that I'm going to remember for the rest of my life just from this conversation so far. So I'm excited to, to get into some more of it. Um, Okay, next question here. Um, this one is again from Henny about just uh, the binaural thing and the surround thing. Mm -hmm. He asks, what binaural settings do you use for the back reverb near and far? And mm -hmm. how is the object size taken into account in the reverb if far is used? I find it tricky with rear back and rear height reverbs. So any ideas around that? Did that question make sense to you? Yeah, it does make sense. Um, so the for reverb itself, most of the time I stay in the mid setting for the binaural. Uh, mm -hmm. That's just, you know, you could also make an argument saying why not far, right? Because it's reverb, it should be further, whatever. But um, overall, basically, I, I settled on mid and was like, this this kind of works. And actually, I use far only at the end of a mix. Basically, I'm, what I'm trying to do is create the Atmos. Uh, the space basically and at that moment i don't particularly think about the binaural just yet you know i mean it, i will start with something where uh most things that should be direct they are actually in off or and the beds are off but the object might be in medium at this moment right so then when i'm but when i'm close it was like okay so this is a pad let's say there's a pad here right why don't we trick why don't we flip that into far we listen to a moment and we're like well is that better or worse it's almost like stereo spreader do we want it what do we not want it? But I wouldn't start with it, right? So in the end, so all the all my reverbs are kind of in medium, uh, medium uh, on the binaural side, and as far as size goes, it's an interesting thing. So when Atmos, not when it first started, because it's actually ten years old, but mm -hmm. um, when it became more documented for the music side of things, like about a year, two years ago, people were saying that the size parameter is to be very, very uh, handled to be very, very uh, uh, delicately because the bigger that you make the size, th there might actually be a problem with the uh, encoding into, into the downstream uh, MP4 renderers. And you can find a very specific paper on that. It has like little dots, like saying like, this is what happens when you put these sound sources in bigger sizes. And this is called clustering, read up on that. So basically, at the beginning of it, it scared the bejesus out of me. I was like, oh, you mean like if I do something like this, then it's gonna, it's just gonna sound good here and never work? Well, that sucks. So I'm gonna stay away from it. So uh, I do not, I, I think I recall that they actually re said like, try to keep size parameters under 20. So it goes from zero to 100 uh, to, to basically keep it reined in. And then I played around with sizes and I was like, well, yeah, it's kind of like a leak. In case you guys don't know, size means it kind of it leaks into adjacent speakers. So the the system all of a sudden, uh, sorry, the sound might come out of three or four speakers. Um, it's slightly different than the positioning of the object itself. Um, but but I felt like in many in most cases, like I, I didn't need it that much. It's like I rather positioned the object into a slightly different place. So. So that's that's what I said. I think I mentioned this in the place. Like I did, uh, I do like quad reverbs instead of surround reverbs. I mean, I use both, but um, I have a setup to have like basically a quad version of my main mixing reverb that I would use in stereo that goes left, right, and then the surround 
uh, surround rear left and right. And then have another version, a copy of it that goes into those same four quad corners in the high channels. So now with two arc sends, I can basically say, okay, so it's supposed to be kind of over here and I can pan into it so and reacts to the panning, which is really sweet. And then I can basically pull it into the high channels. So that com combination of things, whereas I, like, I can basically position the reverb tail wherever I think it should be, that's kind of, that works for me. And I didn't think about it further, further on the binaural side, like it would be better far or mid or near, et cetera. So most of the time that's just stays in mid and it seems to work for me. I, I wonder, yeah, I hope that kind of answers that question. Great, I, th I think so. I think I was, was super detailed. Um, so last question here uh, that I wanted to ask from the uh, premiere that came in and then I'll get uh, to a couple that came in during this uh, new live chat. Yeah. Um, but really good one here from Phil X, uh, who says, do you have any tips? It's a double question. Do you have any tips to avoid overthinking mixing? Mm. And are there any plugins you couldn't live without? <laughs> well, the first one, the overthinking mixing, I don't have a tip for that. I, I am not. There are people who can basically react instinctively to the music and come up with a sweet, sweet ass blend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they somehow perform the mix and it's it's great and it feels good, right? Um, that's kind of like throwing caution in the wind and feeling with your with your creative brain, etc. It's all a good thing. I personally think there's a lot to that. That's a good thing, but it's always at the cost of something else. Mm. The cost being something that you basically forget. So mm. I, there are mixes, I'm not saying names or whatever, but there are mixes that I think feel really great. Overall, feel really great. They're good mixes. They are what's supposed, what the record is supposed to do, whatever. But they have absolute problems, like whatever, it might be over compression. It might be, it might be, uh, actually, that's one of my biggest things, like too linear of a feel to me like of a, of a sound feel, even though they're excited, the, the mix works, everything's good, I'm not knocking it. But I'm like, well, can I have that and then still polish the rest? Does mm. polishing actually take away from the, from the impetus of power and creativity? I don't actually think so. You can't ignore either. Like you should, obviously it's, it's dumb if, if it's the most polished, beautiful mix and then somehow musically doesn't work, that's dumb, I agree. Um, so you have to find either, but if I have time enough, you know, making this one thing more awesome will not derail the mix. You know what I mean? So like, I'm not, I'm not the person who can say, okay, it's done because I'm, I'm done. No, it's done because literally I don't hear anything anymore. You know, right. um, there's nothing left to fix or work on or improve. Yeah. And then, and, and those fixes, how should I say that? Of course, if you do something, if if this song is to be a snotty pop, uh, sorry, snotty punk rock song, right? Mm -hmm. There's no point in making like the most beautiful high end and the most, most great sounding thing because that's actually part that that the part that would take away from the genre. Mm -hmm. That being said, if it takes that to be part of the genre, like if it were an Ariana Grande song that's just super beautiful at all edges, then there is no way I can basically go like oh let me let me go there faster or like let me go there with less care or anything it's just mm -hmm. that's not it you know um so if if the care is in the way of the vibe of course to throw it out but if the care is part of the vibe or doesn't disturb the vibe then why not you know does that, that, that make uh, i think that's the answer that that i would say um yeah let's leave it at that and, and as far as plugins go i mean they are I want to say there's none that I definitely need, mm -hmm. but me, just like everybody else, I don't know if you guys play golf, if you ever play golf. The problem is this. If you stand on a golf course and you take a seven iron and you play the ball and it sucked and it fell into the water, you will on the next core, on the next three holes, not use that iron when you, when you theoretically know this had nothing to do with it, with the club, right. of course. but we are like that. Can I can I EQ something with the what do I like the four thousand uh, brain works channel strip shout out Dirk Ulrich mm -hmm. um, fellow German yeah. um, yes I can 
but I know I'm going to get faster at that. And uh, just like, it makes me, it's almost like it makes me warm and fit, fu uh, feel fu warm and fuzzy inside because I know exactly what happens. But it, if you actually looked at it from a, like, let, just listen to it kind of thing, you can probably do the same thing with many other uh things and i said this in the in the class too like you know i have the fab filter first and the ssl second there's no rhyme or reason why i should definitely use one of the bands in one of in each in either one i just do because what we we are creatures of habit mm -hmm. and this was over time it was something different it was for instance had you asked me that same question about seven years ago i would have said the matrix halo, halo channel strip will be on everything mm -hmm. um and it is still a fantastic plugin but for very specific reasons, I mean, too long to list, like very specific thoughts in my approach. I was like, you know, I think I want to replace it with the fab folder. It's not because it's bad, but I'm trying to also every day improve or at least tickle my fancy, you know. Mm -hmm. And Prince said something funny at one point. He's like, why are you using these different plugins? And I'm like, well, this one I like for guitars and this one I like for, um, for whatever, for drums. And, and he's like, you don't need to do that like like it just pleases you but you're gonna come to a similar outcome mm -hmm. and basically he's like i mixed all whatever my earlier records on the uh, api the D media console that he has basically there's one eq on every channel and actually we come from that i come from ssl boards we never never questioned the eq on the ssl you right. just eq'd it Right, and yeah. now we're using multiple plugins because, well, take a take a seat and think back, and you go like, do you actually have an answer for that? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have an answer to that, then maybe that's okay. But it also maybe means you don't need different uh, tools, or that not that many. Because right. you just it's just somewhere in your head. Now, I'm not. I don't have the all the answers to this. I do both. I'm like, okay, I have whittled down to like less plugins my arsenal that I actually use even though I have thousands. Um, but at the same time, I am just like you going like, well, how about we're using the MC404 on this one because so-and-so does it. Uh, mm -hmm. I've seen it on the internet. I should try it. And then <laughs> this happens at all times. Everybody does this, yeah. you know. And uh, I think that just enjoy that process and know you're never going to arrive there. It's going to always change. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom in both those answers. I'm uh, super glad to have uh, been able to ask you that great question from uh, Phil. So uh, a couple more here um, yeah. from the new live chat. Uh, a whole bunch of folks in here. Hello to uh, all of you, Henny and uh, Lexus and Ray Campbell and Phil and Alexandre and Skeleton Pete and Ant-Man Felix. There's too many to count. Relab. Uh, Randy from Relab is in here. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's probably friend. thrilled that you're using uh, the uh, Lexicon in there. Oh, so uh, hello to all you guys. And um, Fernando asks, do you usually use a high pass filter on kick and bass or leave them or one of those in full range in the sub region? So basically high pass or low cutting on kick and bass. Do you use it on either or both or what are your thoughts there? Um, I use them both, not not religiously. That's something that I like to uh, listen to. You know, I, I I got started very early with the that was a Mac DSP plugin called F two hundred two, which was the Fab filter. Oh, sorry, not Fab filter. It was the Mac DSP kind of filter version that only had two uh, two like a low cut and a high cut on it. So you do that basically more or less to change the slope of the of your EQ. You know, like you might use a shelf on an EQ, but then basically slope it back down with a, with a filter. To me, it's, it's that. It's not like, hey, I'm low cutting the bass or whatever. I, it's, to me, it's like, hey, I'm, I'm pushing the bass, um, uh, pushing, the, pushing the bass EQ as a shelf and then kind of rolling it back down. So getting this curve that you couldn't get with a parametric and you couldn't get with, a, with an analog EQ, really. Um, the interesting part is we're, we're now in a world where crazy bends and uh, and and basically multiple bands. So crazy bends like this, right? And multiple bands because you just click on them are both possible. Like for instance, with a fab filter, you can EQ the bass at every uh, at every uh, diatonic note if you want to. You know uh, that's something that was just simply not possible in an analog world. 
uh, or at least very expensive and probably pretty noisy. <laughs> mm -hmm. You don't want to do that. So now that we can actually almost design our EQ curve in a way, um, I, it's almost like drawing uh, drawing in a new frequency response that is has almost no downsides. I mean, I do like I do like my, uh, cumulative EQs. It's totally fine. Uh, I never never really hear someone where you know I, you should have done this with one EQ. Yeah, you're right. But like in a creative process, I don't do that. I just like add what I need to add or 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 subtract. But like just it's okay to use multiple processes. So the answer is, do I do that? Yes, if I feel that, for instance, the bass has too much rumble and bottom in it that I don't uh, that I don't want, yeah, I will look at it. And same goes for the kick until you get like a tight sound if if that's what's required. But then again, there's like if you have like a um, uh, Neptune's clips grinding kind of open sound, then you know low cutting might not be the the answer. I have no idea if they low cut it or not, <laughs> but that would be my immediate response to that, right? So in the end, uh, the just listen is is obviously the truth, but it's also not a. Basically, you're not doing it wrong. That's what I'm saying. Like, it put, like applying low cuts there is wrong, but not in all cases. Does it, does that make sense? Like, if it's needed, do it. If it's not needed, well, then it's wrong. Just as much as it is would be to whatever, push a vocal to into much high into much too too much high end, etc. So, um, you should feel be free, feel free to do it if default, applicable. Is what yeah, it sounds if, like to me. If it, feel free to do it if applicable. That's that's kind of where it's at. You know, that's that's how I would approach that. Cool. Uh, here's a small question from uh, Lexus. Do you find that in your mixes you have multiple copies of the track you're working on, and by the time you get done with it, you have twenty plus? versions representing every major change you made in the mix so do you find yourself saving lots of versions <clears throat> or even printing lots of versions and kind of coming back to them or is that not something that you do in your approach uh actually i do yeah this is interesting uh, when we used on the uh, used to work on the ssl you had actually an automation computer that let you um save snapshots of the mix and save the mix multiple times so we get into the into the uh, uh, into the habit of basically saying, okay, mix start, and then you go like, whatever, drums in, or like, and then it goes on, and it goes to, um, ah, what was it called? Some people called it, depending on who, for instance, I assisted at the time, called it all plays, which means a static mix of everything that's playing. Um, there was another word for it, and I, I'm blanking on it now, but basically, I, I would save those steps, and I still do that, so yeah, I would have probably, I probably have seven Pro Tools sessions from your first files to where I start. That's just what my assistant creates to specific steps that he has to do so that in case we make a mistake or, or in case we're like, what, what happened? How was it before? We can go a few steps back. But then from where I start to like, let's say mix one that I actually sent out, it's probably another six or seven sessions. And then I say, save, of course, every version. So if a client says, you know, I love everything, but the drums were better on, on version three, what have you, then that can still be connected. So in the end, I end up with like 25, sometimes 30 Pro Tools sessions, depending on what needs to happen at the end, there's STEM sessions for the final output, et cetera. It's, it becomes pretty big and then, uh, because I use the Mac DSP revolver a lot, these sessions become big because it, it actually bakes IRs into the Pro Tools session. So mm -hmm. all of a sudden, the single Pro Tools session is like 30 megs big. Mm -hmm. uh, just, the, just the actual the session file itself, not the audio. Yeah, yeah. It blows up and then you keep... Because you said you, you file... Uh, sorry, because you save often, the session file backup folder oh. might, might blow up to two gigs but right. uh, of course I might throw that out at one point if I go like yeah. weird. But you know, space space is cheap, organization is important. So that's that's how I do it. Cool. All right, we're coming up on close to an hour here. So I think this might be the last question here that we'll, we've got from Eric uh, Iverson, who asks, do you find a balance of all the elements before reaching for plugins? Um It's a good question. So 
I know there's already some plugins at least, or at least there's effects baked in because you're usually using their wet stems and tracks and you have the dry ones underneath. So you're starting a thing with no plugins on it, but they're just all printed, right? So they're kind of like baked in. And then, yeah, his question is, are you trying to get your levels and balances before you go in with plugins or are you diving in plugins earlier in the mix? Well, uh, I mean, the, the process is more like, because I work for stems, the balance I have, however it is being tweaked, we start at the rough mix balance. Whatever you had, we start there. And I use everything in trim mode, trim read mode. I don't know if you guys are familiar. That's the yellow faders in Pro Tools. Basically, I'm, I'm starting with a mix that's like the rough mix. And I decide the delta of the stems. Basically, I said, okay, this is cool, uh, but I want more piano. So now the trim fader goes up, let's say, 3 dB. And I can see that I changed the mix by 3 dB on the piano. So it's it's almost like quality control. It's like, oh, well, what have you actually done? I can see by the fader position how far it differs. It's also very important. Like if I push a fader up by like say eight dB, I'm like, I literally ask myself, are you sure? Like, what are you doing, Richard? <laughs> like, like were they this wrong? <laughs> that that's surprising, right? So, but that being said, like the plugins that are on there is basically what would be my console, like a, a four thousand and a fab filter. With the fab filter being flat, the four thousand also being flat. But I, like I said in the in the in the uh, in the master class, because they have that TMT design that kind of shifts the left and right a little bit. There is something being done to it so the the mix itself even though musically it's the same balance as the rough mix already sounds a little bit better i hate that word um than than what they sent to me but you know there i don't know there was a mo funny moment in the master class when i clicked on the fab filters and i was actually trying to show you guys something that i was eq and i think three or four clicks further i didn't find a fab filter that had an eq curve on it <laughs> Right. We probably yeah. edited that out, maybe, of the presentation. I'm not sure. Well, I don't, I don't know, but I was like, remember, it's but it's true, yeah. you know, like like a, on an Al Schmidt level, level, right? I, I try to not EQ it if I don't have to. Like, what mm -hmm. for, right? If the sound is good. And again, we're talking about people that have done something to it. They've chosen a synth sound that has a specific brightness. Why do I change it? I, I'm not going to change it until it uh, until it fills a need, so to speak. Um, so, so, so yeah, there's plugins, but they basically don't do anything. So I say this, there's more facilities. Like you wouldn't sit in front of a computer uh, console and rip out all the EQs at the beginning of a mix. They're just right. there and turned off. Yep. Yeah. You know? But the busing is there. You can't avoid it. You go on and go through that busing. So that's your plugins that are on your channel. So there's a little bit of that going on, but there's nothing on it. Like there's not a smiley curve on the mix bus or anything like, like people do that, which is fine. I'm not saying that it's bad. I'm just, I just don't do that. Um, there's nothing pre-done. There's it's something very important when people ask me, do you use templates? And I'm like, yeah, I use a template, but the template is not something where I now I plug in my, your files and now magically some awesome sound will come out right. that i think i think is totally dumb i think it's it's unapplicable it's it's kind of not what mixing is about it's a little boring it's cheating at best and like it's cheating at best and at the worst it's kind of like what are you doing you don't know what the music is is that's gonna come under your face like what, what kind of audacity do you have to put like a template on it <laughs> right yeah, like a, yeah. a, a preset sound that's like weird and then the same thing like presets i don't like them at all so i think i think eq presets for that matter are a really dumb thing i think at best this is what other people do with with kick drums whatever but at worst it will never sound good so i would yeah. throw them all out that's why i also and you will i will write presets for reverbs hey randy <laughs> <laughs> no because because that's an actual sound i can add right that's beautiful yeah. but i will probably not never write an e a preset with an actual eq curve it's kind of a little weird i mean i probably have somewhere but but that's my feeling about it so but that being said, I have a template that is has routing, it has facilities, it has uh, EQs that happen to be flat because I want to grab them, not insert them every time. That's what I have. That makes sense for me as a template. But one that you hope that a record comes out, I think I think that's that's an ill advised. 
Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, having a template that is structural that gets the extra steps of having to route to buses, insert plugins so you can just grab things and go and stay more intuitive instead of switching back and forth. Oh, there's something I want to do. Now let me go through three steps so I can do it. That's also kind of dumb if you can just yeah. have everything already set up. But I totally get what you mean, especially about EQs. I mean, you if you had an EQ that was like, make your kick drum brighter, it's like, sure, maybe on 70% of mixes, you need to make your kick drum a little bit brighter, but brighter where? On a rock mix, it's here, and an R&B mix, it's here, but it's also that particular kick drum. This particular kick drum wants to get brighter at 1K, and this particular kick drum wants to get brighter at 5K. They're two totally different things. How could you have a preset for that? You'd have to have so many presets for each possible type of kick drum you'd ever get that why not just EQ it, you know, because you can spend as much time picking the right preset as you would just, uh, just EQing. So I think really? one last final question for you here. Um, is uh, uh that was going to be the last question but st I, I think i'm saying right stogie moods uh mm -hmm. he's asked this question twice so i have to ask if you i avoided it because i thought the answer was maybe too obvious but maybe it's not um he says hey should i invest in better gear guitar etc or should i simply get better at mixing and then he asks again hey what's more important the actual gear or mixing itself i mean um I do think it's both. I do think it's both. There's, you know, you have bad gear, it will sound bad. But the same goes for like practicing and being better at your instrument. You will make something that sound that like a cheaper Squire bass, whatever. Better, you will make it sound better than somebody else with a Fender P bass mm -hmm. that is not as good. So th these things are connected. If the question is like, where should I put my resources to get better sounding records? Mm -hmm. Then, uh, then, uh, then it's an easy answer for me, which is one better monitoring yes that's the easiest and then the second is practicing mixing mm -hmm. a technology yeah that's true but like even even if have have pro tools with whatever the stock plugins which by the way uh whatever pro trip pro tip the eq3 in pro tools sounds excellent yeah it is i like not just like yeah it's cool but no it sounds great like i have yeah. done shootouts with like 30 eq plugins and it was standing in the last four, definitely. Uh, so, like, there is really no reason why you can't make a decent sounding record with just the stock plugins, you know. But like, if you can't hear it, then basically you don't know how to, how far to uh, to uh, uh, to, uh, to move the knob, and that's that's the most important thing. Actually, mixing itself is not a hard task. You know, they, it's always the same stuff. Compress it a little bit, EQ it a little bit, put some verb on it, get a level. That's literally what it is. Turn up what you like, turn down what you don't like. The end. It's not a hard process, not a surprising thing. That's why actually whenever you open a uh, whatever a masterclass, including mine, you will probably not see something that you've never heard before. Right. You, you're you going to see something philosophy-wise uh, philosophy that works for me, but it's not. I'm not going to put up a plugin that you go like, I've never heard of this process in the world. No, it's always the same. So the, fa the fact is you need to practice, but you can only practice what you can hear. Um, th that's the combination. But like, I mean, if the gear is decent, I think you're going to be all right. Cool stuff. Well, I think uh, here at about an hour of q and I think uh, this is a, a good place to stop. And I think it's a good note to end on. Richard, um, beautiful stuff. Uh, there were really some amazing moments for me in there. Uh, I'm going to remember a lot of this conversation for a long time to come and a lot of the stuff that I saw in your masterclass. I especially love the insight you had about uh, bass and how you think about uh, mixing bass and handling it that we had in this Q&A. In the live part, just hearing how you treated drums, uh, seeing the structure of your sessions was awesome and really understanding how you think about uh, Atmos mixing and going from mm. stereo to these other formats. So just so much good stuff in there. Uh, big thanks for being here. I also want to give big thanks to the artist Gentle Bones and Julia Wu for letting us go under the hood of this track. Uh, fantastic stuff. Uh, check them out. I've linked to Gentle Bones's uh, Instagram page, I think in the description of both yeah. videos. I also want to give a shout out to Sonarworks, making this one free to the public. Uh, when Richard was asked, hey, if you're going to upgrade gear, what's the most important gear to upgrade? Your room and your monitoring which seems to be the answer. Yeah. And that's what Sonarworks is well-equipped to do. I mean, obviously you want to get the best 
speakers that make sense for your budget. Obviously, you want to do some treatment in your room. Acoustic treatment really helps. But um, assuming that you've put in some resources there, you're going to hit a point of diminishing returns where it's like the most cost-effective way to improve your room now could be EQ correction. Uh, and Sonarworks is awesome at that. Also for headphones, even if you're just mixing on headphones, they can make them flatter. So check them out, sonarworks.com. Their sound ID reference solution is awesome. And even in a high-end room like Richard's, there's a place for it. Uh, he's matching his monitors, uh, basically using the, that solution as well as handling all of his multi-channel uh, routing and uh, stuff like that. So a uh, big thanks to those guys. There is a MixCon mega giveaway going on. So look in the description down below. And in the comments, we should have a link to the MixCon Mega Giveaway or type in MixCon Mega Giveaway into the search bar. We're giving away over $10,000 with a free gear and there's multiple chances to win. So definitely check it out. Yes, people do, really do win the stuff. We give away more than $100,000 $100, with a free gear every year. And yeah. uh, this time it's uh, over 10K in gear. So check it out. And Richard, what would be the best places for people to check you out, uh, find out more about you, follow what you're doing, uh, websites, uh, social media pages that they should check out? Where's the best places to keep up with you? Well, the, the, the quickest is the, so the, all my uh, Instagram is Richard Furch Mix, easy. Uh, and uh, my actual website is just my name, richardfurch.com. That's all about my mixing here and overseas because I do a lot of uh, uh, Asian mixes because that's the next thing that's coming mm -hmm. uh, tip, tip. <laughs> actually just uh, just one this is basically this is not kidding this is a chinese grammy beautiful like it's called a golden melody award for best engineered album i just won this like this month which was nice cool. um but congrats uh, and and then if you if you like how i talk about stuff there is actually there are some master classes at emixing.com e-m-i-x-i-n-g.com yeah, type that um, right to the chat right here so they, you have, they uh, happen to be full both for, hmm? go ahead you, you have even more full-length kind of uh, tutorials on mixing at emixing.com that's right there's two there's two of them they happen to be c-pop uh which is chinese because obviously i have a good i have a good grasp there like it was a very a reasonable thing to make for them but apart from the fact that the lyrics are in chinese everything is just top class mixing information so if you don't uh, if you don't mind that's a that's a really good one so uh, actually two of them out there and um you know i, I like doing this I, I like do i do this in person i do this uh, in master classes around the world i've done it in cologne in beijing in uh, new york at berkeley my alpha my alma maters are berkeley and the sae so uh, I, I've, I've gone around. I, I like it. I'm pretty good. At it, so there you go. I think so. <laughs> uh, and I'm checking out the e-mixing website right now. It looks like you've got two master classes. We go deep with actually some pretty big artists from Asia. One is JJ Lin, who is a uh, very notable in Asia. And then Jem, I think she's kind of huge. Like she has uh... that song is actually the most streamed YouTube song uh, in China ever of all music. Wow. Yeah, very I cool. Yeah, she's a, uh, a she's a major, major artist. If you don't know Gem, I think there's a, a you know European and American listeners who are familiar with her as well. But uh, yeah. uh, gorgeous work, um, uh, really inspiring person, and uh, yeah. So and it's just it's so cool to hear. Um, I love the back and forth on this one, the gentle bones between you know, switching between Chinese and English lyrics, and there's yeah. just this great blend of pop and R and B, and it's both like immediately accessible and understandable to a Westerner, but different at the same time, you know, there's um, something cool about it. So tremendous work there. Check out emixing.com. If you want even more with Richard, he's got at least two great uh, full length master classes there, richardfurch.com. If you want to know more about his work, super uh, humbled and impressed to have you on. This is a guy who has uh, over 400 album credits. I think he's been on almost two dozen Grammy nominated albums. And I think like a half dozen of them have won Grammys. He's got multiple, not only platinum, but diamond selling releases under his belt. So I think one of the most impressive and inspiring mixes, uh, mixers out there. And as of this week and today, I know one of the best people talking about mixing who I've got to uh, meet and interview about this stuff. I really appreciate your insight. So uh, Richard, thanks again so much for being here. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And it was a great idea. And thanks for Martins and Katrina to actually hook it up, uh, the guys at Sound ID. So it's awesome. Wonderful. So a Sonar Work Sound ID reference, if you want to get to know Martins, I'm going to be talking to him uh, on a live Q&A tomorrow. I believe that one is happening 
at uh, three o'clock Eastern time. So around the same time tomorrow, we're going to have a live Q and A with Martins where we'll be talking about um, uh, kind of treating your room using sonar works as a solution, getting your monitoring situ situation better. So if you have any questions about, we'll also be talking about room treatment, speaker selection, headphone selection, and then EQ correction. So everything about getting your monitoring better, which is possibly the most important part of the gear in your room is your room your, and your whole monitoring situation. So that's what tomorrow is going to be about. Uh, big thanks again to Richard. Big thanks to Gentle Bones. Big thanks to SonarWorks. Big thanks to you guys for hanging out with us. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop with Richard Furch. Thanks for hanging out with us. See you next time. Yeah.